in the bad old days, all you had to do was deploy to find out that new versions of it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that was no longer available as an option. Um, so we actually added to Bundler 1.1 a command called Bundle Outdated. This is actually a uh, contributed feature. Um, we've been maintaining it, but somebody just sort of came out of the woodwork and said, I feel like writing this feature. Here you go. And it was really cool. Um, I, this was pretty much the first time that that ever happened to me with any significant feature. Um, so Bundle Outdated basically does what it says on the tin. You run it, it talks to Ruby Gems, and it says, oh, by the way, here are all the gems that you have in your app that you could upgrade if you wanted to. And you didn't even have to deploy to find that out. Um, the next thing that people started complaining about was uh, orphaned gem files. Um, I think this was actually mostly a problem with Heroku. Uh, yeah. Uh, so this was a problem when people would complain that their select size were too big because over time you would change your gem file or update your gems, and we would keep around all the gems when you use dash dash path. They all get isolated and installed in a directory. Um, and so Heroku would not clean these up because the bundler didn't have this functionality. Um, the alternative was to re-bundle every time, but I don't think people wanted that to happen with bundle 1.0. That's pretty slow. Yeah. Um, so this was actually my first contribution to bundler when I joined the team, uh, was to add a bundle clean method. And basically, it will go through and look at your existing gem file.lock and figure out what gems are actually in use. And all the other gems and gem versions that are not, it will go and clean those up and remove all the files associated with them. So you have the smallest possible subset available of the gems that you need. Yeah, so um, it's uh, this feature also actually, it turns out, once it was written, can come really in handy in development. If you're using, uh, if you have multiple applications and you have each application's gem <coughs> installed off, you're using bundle install dash dash path, um, you can actually run bundle install dash dash clean to activate the auto clean feature. And from that point forward, whenever you install your development, gems will be cleaned up and you won't end up with you know your most heavily developed app with a gem bundle that is slowly taking over your hard drive. Um, this was a problem that some people reported with 1.0 where after a few months of changing gems and adding gems and deleting gems, their bundle had grown to be 10 or 20 times the size of their actual app. Um, so, AutoClean comes in pretty handy if that's your development setup. Um, it's pretty cool. Uh, we don't do it automatically for rollback reasons. Um, all right. So, like, if you have a catastrophe and you're deploying and you need to roll back, you probably want your old gems around. Um, we initially had it implemented that way, and then someone complained and realized we broke some work. So, we rolled that back. Yeah. Um, so the next thing that people started complaining about once Bundler 1.0 was actually in wide use was subshells. Um, interestingly, like you would think, oh, you know, if you're shelling out from your bundled application, you probably want your subshell to have the same set of bundled gems available. Um, and that's totally true right up until the point that you realize that there are many extremely popular command line utilities that you don't realize are actually Ruby. Um, People started running up against this when they wrote rate tasks for their application that shelled out to, say, Homebrew to install Redis because it was an application dependency. And suddenly Homebrew exploded because it wasn't in the bundle. That turned out to be a pretty big problem. Um, so in 1.0, we tried to solve this. And it turned out we didn't actually solve it. Um, and in 1.1, the, uh, the same method only got with clean end is still present, but it actually works correctly and completely strips out everything that Bundler changed or did, and your your subshell from inside with clean end will be completely free of Bundler's influence, and you'll be able to use Homebrew or use the gist command line tool or whatever else it is that you were planning on using from the command line that happens to be Ruby but isn't in your bundle. Um, it's, not the best solution ever, but we had to come up with something that let you subshell both inside the bundle and outside the bundle, and this is what we have so far. Uh, this is also used a lot for people who have CI apps, I guess, that have a jump file ready and you're trying to execute something within a jump, another jump file, um, so you don't have to keep overriding bundle underscore jump file the environment variable and try to essentially do the same thing. Yeah. Um, 
So uh, this totally like was a surprise to me, but something that happened pretty quickly after 1.0 came out was we started getting pull requests to <coughs> add top level bundle commands like uh, bundle grep and bundle ack and bundle rak all in a row because everyone now that they had a bundle wanted to search their bundle and only their bundle. Um, people I guess had never really tried to do this before or had something set up that let them search through all of their installed Ruby gems. And suddenly now that they had bundles, people were like, well, you should let me search only in my bundle. Um, and of course, it seemed like a bad idea to accept pull requests that created three different top level searching commands, depending on your favorite search utility. Um, so we kind of had a little powwow, and we came up with something that lets you just extract out, or not extract, but just ask Bundler for the, the paths of all the gems in your bundle. Um, this turns out to be really useful because it means that you can just pass that to act or grep for your tool of choice and very quickly search through specifically only the files in the gems that are in your bundle. Um, it's also actually pretty easy to just turn it to a function and then you can, uh, once you've done that, just back your way through your bundle for you know, egress and that um, And that's actually both useful and fast. Um, so that was a sort of unexpected development of having Bundler out there that you know, I didn't see at all for sure. Um, the next and somewhat larger problem that people started asking about, and it has sort of ramped up over time, and then for a while this was almost the only question that I got asked about Bundler was, what do I do if ops won't let me install Bundler as a system gem? Um, people had, for whatever reason, lots of ops teams that said, oh, we will install the Ruby package for you, and we will install the Ruby gems package for you, and now you don't have sudo. Good luck. Um, and people came up with sometimes really tacky workarounds for the fact that they couldn't install a bundle gem at the system level. Um, so unless you know, you're, you're this guy, and you can just solve it that way. Um, but most people, sadly, were not able to do this. And uh, so Bundler 1.1, also includes a feature that basically amounts to self-loading bundles. Um, it's pretty easy to use. You can just uh, call bundle install dash dash standalone. This, this feature was guest contributed by uh, Yehuda. Um, and once you've, once you've installed your bundle as a standalone bundle, um, it doesn't actually require a bundler to exist from that point forward. Um, it just creates a file named bundler setup bundler slash setup.rb that you can require inside your app, you know, very similarly to the way that you require bundler slash setup in when the bundler gem is available. But instead of loading the Ruby gem, it's actually a really straightforward file that just sets up the load paths for all of the gems in the bundle that just got installed. Um, this is really cool in the sense that like you can create a packaged version of your app or a deployable package that doesn't care about the system level stuff as long as Ruby is available, it's not even actually invoking Ruby gems itself, it's just setting up the load path for you and saying, now you can require whatever you want. Um, yeah. So let's get into uh, one of the biggest features probably in Bundle 1 was uh, the speed up of Bundle install and sort of the process uh, we did to get it there. Um, so just to give context and examples, um, we're just going to have this really simple gem file uh, sources for rubygems.org um, and then just have this not your gem. Um, so just looking at the latest version of Bundler 1.0, when we run a bundle install, you get the infamous fetching source index for rubygems.org <coughs> and then you have to wait and you're still waiting and you should probably still hang in there and then eventually it finally finishes. And just for a single uh, Sinatra gem uh, with its dependencies, it's like it has four dependencies or something, it uh, takes about 18 seconds. And it should not take 18 seconds to install five gems. Um, so just going back to that source index, like let's look at what it actually does. So we need to build up the index of all the gems available to us to actually resolve. So the first thing that 
Fondler does during that phase is it needs to fetch the modern index from RubyGems.org. And this include this is specs.4.8.gz, so you can download this from RubyGems. And we also need the pre-release specs in case you're using pre-release gems. So let's go ahead and download it. Uh, I did this while writing the slides, and looking at the current index, it was under a megabyte. So anyone on a decent network connection, it does not take 17 seconds to download one megabyte. So clearly, it's not the network traffic that is slowing us down here. Um, but let's look into the actual spec, the modern index itself, and see what is contained. So it's just a Marshall array of um, this tuple of the gem name, the gem version, and the platform that's running. For most gems, this is Ruby, but you have stuff like Java or MSUWIN32x86 for Windows um, and other things like that. And then we also need to, one of the things you notice is it doesn't actually include any of the dependency information. So that's all contained inside the gem spec file. So the resolver actually makes a call out to fetch each of the gem specs that it needs um, to fetch this information to try to resolve the gem file that you've given it. So if we just go look at this gem spec file, we can see that it returns an array of gem dependency objects that contain similar information. Um, what kind of, what the name of the gem is, what the requirements are, um, if it's a development or runtime dependency. So Bundler 1.0 will actually, it downloads the whole index and constructs it in memory. Um, and when it came out on older slice boxes that only had 250 megabytes of RAM, you couldn't actually run Bundler because it would take more RAM that was available than on the box than the box had itself. Um, and so this only gets worse every day as people release more gems and more versions of each gem. Um, so the problem's only gonna get worse. So let's take a look at what the latest version of Bundler 1.1 does. Um, the first thing you'll notice is that we don't have that source index line. Um, we're fetching the gem data from rugems.org. And then the second thing you'll probably notice is it's a lot faster. So we went from about 18 seconds to a little over three. So I guess that's a little under one-sixth of the time, or a little over one-sixth of the time that was needed. So it's a pretty huge speech improvement. Um, so at the heart of that, uh, if we go look at the fetching gem metadata, what it actually does is that Nick Caranto and Matt um, built this endpoint on rubygems.org. And basically, you pass a comma-separated comma value list of all the gems that you need. And it will return the first level of dependencies back. Um, so if we just write some Ruby code, it's pretty simple. Let's marshal load, um, open that URL for Sinatra, and it will return the name, the version number, uh, what platform it's running, and an array of tuples of the requirements of the dependencies. And this is pretty similar to the modern index as well as having the gem spec information there. So if we just go through a quick scenario of that gem file running through 1.1, um, if you pass debug um, to any, if you set debug to any anything, Bundler will output a verbose, some verbose debug information. Um, and so, just quickly stepping through this, the first thing we're going to pass all the gems in that gem file. In our case, it was just Sinatra, and then the endpoint will return the first level dependencies, and then we pass those back through, and you sort of just iterate through until you have an empty lists where you don't have any dependencies you need to specify anymore. Um, Bundler keeps track of gems that you already passed through, so we're not repeating queries that have already happened, because we don't need to <coughs> relearn what dependencies you need for that gem. And this is the actual implementation that came out in Bundler 1.1 pre-5, and I thought that was all you needed to get to work, but it turns out that's not the case. And Everything's always more complicated than it actually seems to be. Um, and the issue that was brought up was that, well, what happens if I have a private gem repo um, and I have this gem there? So if we have the gem foo um, and it depends on var, uh, 
when we fetch the information uh, and we fetch for bar, we we don't actually have the whole graph anymore like we did in 1.0. So we wouldn't have the information of the dependencies for um, BAS 1.3. And so when you actually go to do the resolve, you would Bundler would say, sorry, I don't have enough information to complete, and it would just exit out. Um, and obviously this isn't good at all. So we end up having to implement some edge cases around using that point. Um, the first edge case is just like, so let's just say that the private gem repo implements the API as well. Um, this case is probably the simplest one, since we can naturally just query both endpoints until we have zero unmet dependencies. And then we have the full graph that we need to pass the resolver, and we don't have to make any more network calls there. Um, but this probably isn't the case for most people who have a private gem repo set up. Uh, a lot of people are probably just using like gem in a box and just complying with having the modern index around and not actually building out the API as well. Um, so in this case, we have the full modern index on the private repo and then the API endpoints for Ruby gems. And now we need to figure out what the unmet dependencies are. Um, this means that we have to actually go and fetch all of the gem specs from the private gem repo because the modern index, like we saw before, doesn't have any of the dependency information. This is great if you don't have a lot of gems on that server um, because you know, just making those network calls is not that expensive. But if you have a ton of gems, then you have to fetch every single gem spec on that server. So we had to change this code because let's say Ruby Gems API endpoint is like 500 ing then we're gonna try and fetch every single gem spec on rubygems.org, and that's probably bad and would seriously increase the uh, S3 bill for Ruby Gems for that downtime while that API is down. So basically what we do is we just fall back to the modern index and you're sort of left with uh, bundler 1.0 speeds, which seems acceptable since people have been doing it for a while now. Um, so we actually allow you to bypass uh, the API endpoints in case there's problems or you're just like waiting a long time for your bundle to install. Um, you can actually just pass this dash dash full index here and we'll just fetch the source index. Um, and we actually do fallback here. Uh, so if rubygems.org is 500ing on their API or for some reason it's not working, um, instead of forcing you to run the previous command again, we just rerun it for you um, in using the modern index. All right. So um, now that Bundler, at least version 1.1, is significantly faster and uh, bundle install no longer is so slow, uh, we wanted to talk a little bit about stuff that we have coming up in future versions of the Bundler. Um, the, uh, absolutely, the biggest thing that we have as a priority in future versions of Bundler is a shorter release cycle. Um, we've been working on Bundler 1.1 for a little over 18 months now, and while it contains totally cool stuff that is forever in internet years, um, so our, our main goal with future versions of Bundler is to get the new cool stuff <coughs> cut down into individual releases and get it out and have people using it in a much smaller amount of time. Um, so here are some of the features that we're trying to get into soon upcoming versions of both. Um, first one is the uh, Ruby version check, which is basically just the idea that your application is your 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 application is written against specific versions of gems, um, but in most cases your application is written against a specific version of Ruby as well. Um, it could be written against. 187, it could be written against 193, it could be written against, you know, uh, Rubinius. Um, but most of the time, when you want to make sure that the same code is running in deployment and in development, you also want to make sure that the same interpreter is running in deployment and development. Um, so, sort of the essence of a Ruby version check would just be that Bundler will happily tell you when you have attempted to load your bundle on the wrong Ruby interpreter and your results are now unsupported or undefined. Um, 
since RVM and RBN do not share a place for you to declare which version of Ruby your application should use, um, we're kind of hoping that this can be like a uh, application-wide declaration, and it would be totally awesome if RBM and or RBN took advantage of the fact that there was a single place where it was declared to uh, know which version of Ruby to invoke. Um, I will try talking to them. Hopefully that will also become easier in the future. Um, the next feature that it, this is probably the largest like pain point complaint um, in the people who are already using the fast version of Bundler. Um, if you're developing, I mean, now that Bundler exists, people have taken advantage of how easy it is to use gems with their application and turn a lot of things that used to be in the lib directory into gems of their own. Um, and this is really, really cool. It's increased reusability of code. It's increased other people's ability to contribute code. But the main downside to breaking out of stuff that your application, you know, like if you're co-developing a gem and your application at the same time, it's a gigantic pain in the butt. Because what you have to do is change your gem file to say, oh, by the way, the code that I actually want to use while I'm developing this gem is over here, using the path option. Um, and in deployment, that doesn't work because you don't have a checked out copy of that gem in the middle of editing. So you end up either doing a horrible dance of editing your gem file continuously or discovering that you didn't check in your code, push your code to GitHub, run bundle update, and then restart your development application. Either way, this slows down the, the cycle of development, and that seems like a bad thing. So the feature that we are currently discussing and trying out different implementations of is local gems. And fundamentally what it does is it just lets you say, I have a gem checked out, and I'm going to be editing it. And if it's there, use it. And if it's not there, go back into the, you know, like fall back on the Git repository and install as you normally would. Um, this does amazing things for productivity if you're in the middle of developing a gem and your app at the same time. It has the potential caveat that you develop your gem and your app and your gem and your app, and then you push your app to production and the code in your gem that doesn't come along with if you didn't check it in, push it, release it, whatever. Um, so we're working on ways to make that less of a problem and at least be able to give you a warning that says, oh, by the way, you probably aren't going to get the code that you're thinking you're going to get. Um, but What's the lock file look like? uh, it doesn't actually go into the lock file. The local version stays in the gem file, um, at least in our, our current implementation that we're testing. Um, so. Uh, and the last feature that we're actively working on for near future versions of Bundler is sort of the holy grail of Bundler, um, not having to bundle exec at all. Um, yay, here we are. Yeah, um, so the reason why you have to bundle exec is of course that when you're in your application, you want rate to be the version that your application wants, but even though you're there, you might want to use another command that isn't part of your application, and we can't provide you with a bundle no exec command to do the inverse. Um, so the, the plan, and hopefully this will work out, but um, it seems like it should, is that Bundler will provide smarter auto-bundle invoking bin stubs, um, and you will be able to either manually put those bin stubs into your path, there will be a, you know, like a specific location that you can either add to your path yourself or that RBM can add to your path automatically for your bundle. Um, and those smarter bin stubs will say, oh, rake is in your bundle, so you're going to get your bundled version of rake. But gist is not in your bundle, so you're going to get the RubyGems version of gist. And that actually solves this problem, we think. Um, so keep an eye out for the Ruby's version of Bundler coming soon that lets you stop bundle exacting because we would love to get people testing it. Um, that pretty much covers everything that we had about Bundler at the moment. Do you guys have any questions? Yeah?
One one final. Uh, yes, one one will be final. <laughs> uh, it will be as soon as it's humanly possible. We really want to get it out the door as a final version. Um, we have a couple of known, very obscure edge cases that we need to iron out and make sure are working, and then we will have a final RC. Um, yes. Uh, Jeremy Heingartner here. I actually write one of the uh, private gem servers, Stickler, and I will be implementing the dependency API. So. Stickler, okay, so the private gem server Stickler, yeah. maintained by Jeremy Heingartner, yeah. will be adding the gem cutter API, so you will be able to install your gems more quickly even if your private gem server is Stickler. Um, that seems cool. <laughs> Seems like you're always dependent on there being a network connection. Is there a way to bundle, like, put all your gems in one place and then install, like, if you had no network connection? From yes. Um, no network connection is totally feasible. You run uh, the bundle pack command, and it fetches proactively every gem that you need and shoves it into vendor cache. At that point, you're done. Um, you can then run bundle however you want. It doesn't pack get uh, repos, though. So There is a patch under testing that packs get repos. Um, that, I mean, no network connection has not been as big of a concern of other users. There's like a small local, very, very small local minority. Um, but <laughs> no one was willing to test the Git packing patch, so it's it languished for a while. Um, hopefully, that local minority will get on it and that patch will end up in a near future version of Bundle. Yeah. Yes, um, path goes in your lock. Um, there are lots of people using path in their lock because they have put the gem into, say, vendor gems or somewhere else that has a path that is specific to their application, and that needs to be locked. Um, So the local option is a development only path, basically, and that's why it has to have a separate API. Yeah. Yeah. All right. 